So the winner of the 2022 Turing Award is someone who won the award for the invention, standardization, and commercialization of internet. The winner is Robert McCalton McAfee. And because I have majored in computer networking myself, it is an honor to be able to give an explanation of his work. So there are many students here, and I think you may not be familiar with the name Robert McAlfe, but uh, and I also think maybe some of you know what Ethernet is, but for many people, they are, do not know exactly what Ethernet is. So first of all, I would like to explain what uh, Ethernet is. So briefly to explain myself, I uh, worked a lot in the area of communications. For my master's, I talked about LAN and ISDN, and I did uh, work at GTE, AT&T, and Sprint as well. And one of my major papers has to do with measuring telecommunications. So this picture was made by Ethernet Alliance. It is an industry consortium of member organizations. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization dedicated to the advancement of Ethernet technologies. And so they're talking about how from automations to automotives and enterprises such as schools or companies and even service providers. Sometimes we call it the back boom network between the companies and even cloud providers. They are all use Ethernet. So the font is a bit small, but so you may not be able to see, but on the bottom of the very right, you can see that the speed of Ethernet has increased in, uh, by enormously over the past years. So if you look at the changes in Ethernet speed over the years, in the 1980, it was about 10 megabytes per <coughs> second Ethernet. And then it increased by about 10 times every 10 years. So it started to increase from 10 gigabits to 100 gigabits to 400 gigabits. So currently, we are we can enjoy the internet speed of about uh, 400 gigabits. And there are continuing efforts to increase the speed of Ethernet to 1.6 uh, terabits as well. So many people ask, is Ethernet and Internet the same thing? Because many people have heard of Internet, but not so much about Ethernet. So are the two different? So let's look into what that is. So Internet is used anywhere. And so Ethernet is the same. It's everywhere. So Ethernet is one of the technologies that comp compromise what Internet is. So the two are not the same. So the Internet so using several different technologies like wireless networks, that is what the internet is. Ethernet is the core technology that leads to the internet. So for example, I believe you may have these kinds of wireless routers. This is the wireless router at my home. So you can see that there is a cable connecting it to the wall. And even in my laboratory, you can find behind your desktop so many plugs. And so one of them is the Ethernet plug. And underneath the, ch the students' desks, you can also find hubs. And also, if you look at some expensive uh, wireless routers, you can also find these kinds of connections. And you can also find a cable leading to the ground. And but because we are, you know, an engineering school, we have all of the lines hidden below the floor. So where do all these lines go? Lines go. They go to the server room. So you can see that in the front, it all seems very clean. But actually, if you look at it from the back, there are so many cables connected. And this is all Ethernet. And you can see a lot of switches. So in all kinds of electronic rooms and wire rooms, you can see these kinds of switches. So this is a photo from 2 p.m. today. So it's very new. And so the cables and the technologies, this is all what Ethernet compromises of. So you may have seen these kinds of data centers. This is the data center of Google. And again, if you look at the data, data center from behind, you can see so many Ethernet cables. So going back to the image, even 
even in cars, the internet is used, <coughs> and for cloud services, it is used as well. For service providers, they are the people like SK Broadband or LG U Plus in Korea. You use Giga Internet at home, right? So, and if you look at the internet, it, you can see the wireless router is all connected to some cables, and the cables all link to the switches in the basement of the building. So, the major telephone companies, such as Kuro, they also are connected to Ethernet. To explain Ethernet, we need to first of all go over some of the basics. So Ethernet just didn't drop, appear suddenly from the sky one day. There was something before Ethernet that played a very large role for the success of Ethernet. And this technology is called packet switching. Packet switching base created these a basis for success for Ethernet. Packet switching means created the paradigm switch between the monopoly on telephone networks on resources to resource sharing. So what does re resource sharing mean? You may have heard that term a lot. This is a map of Korea's highways. And from everyone here, if you are very young, I think you may not understand what a LAN cable a telephone is. So I want to explain this as simply as possible. So you are trying to go to Busan to Seoul, and you want to use the first lane. So uh, before the telephone lanes, they had a monopoly over that first lane, and only you could use that road. So that was the per currently uh, previously existing telephone networks. But there are many different lanes. So from you can use the second lane or the third lane based on which part of the region you are. Uh, in the past, only one person had a monopoly over that lane. So the federal government of the United States realized that this is very ineff inefficient. So when people try to make a call, they want to have two people. So if two people are making a call, if one person is talking, the other person is listening. So the efficiency rate is only 50% unless both people are talking at the same time. So usually when people talk, you speak and breathe and speak and pause. And that pause can be quite long. So if you think about it, the actual efficiency of the currently existing telephone lanes were not very efficient. So instead of that, if you think about how cars can freely drive on the roads, now the, the United States came up with the idea of putting the information in packets and then send the packets through communications lanes. So from the 1960s, we started to see the rise of packet switching technologies. So after the world, after the winning World War II, there were so many <coughs> advancements in technology, such as Alan Turing, who wanted the, who uh, did a large, played a large role in crypto security. So the United States uh, made a lot of investments in computer networking and computers, and then they realized they want to connect the computers through networking. So at the same time, the United States, um, Britain, and France, they did, they were doing, they started to do a lot of research in packet switching. So in the UK, Donald Davies created the uh, packet network, and in, while in France, the packet switching network was created, while in the United States, the message block network was created. And Leonard Kleinlock from the USA is uh, from theory. So especially if you are doing OR in systems engineering, then you would know what his work is. So he applied Q, the queuing theory to packet switching. So these people all made uh, large advancements and played a large role in the development of packet switching.
So telephone networks and internet is different. So no longer the lanes were no longer monopolized by telephone networks. What packets do is there is a switch and router and router between the connection lines. So the packet is like a unit. It's like a car that you know takes people. People right go in the car and they. Uh, move forward. So packets are kind of a store and moving forward type of technology. And then, so in a packet, you make sure that everyone in the car that started in the car, you all arrive at the same place. And the traffic is bursty. What this means is, as I briefly said before, if there was a monopoly on the communication line and it was not used 100%, sometimes it was used and it was not used. So that that's what it means by bursty. Sometimes there were a lot of there would be a lot of packets that come, but then sometimes there wouldn't be any packets. Just like we are talking, we talk and then we pause and then we talk and pause. So. If when audio is digitized, it's also very bursty. So the traffic is very bursty. And in the past, the routings were not in packet units. So in the past, if you were to go to Seoul to Busan, you would call the, the lane and say, I need to use this lane, so keep the lane empty from such and such a time. And then I would start the car from Seoul and then it would go all the way to Busan. And all car and then all cars would go the same way, but for routing the pack the information moves in packets. So while I am making an internet call, all of the packets do not go the same lane. Some packets go through the Guro telephone station, telephone company, if there's a problem there, then it could use a different communication route. And to make the internet, the core needs to be simple. So if there are too many uh, functions, complicated functions in the routing, then it becomes too uh, also too difficult to fix as well. So many of the complicated functions need started to be taken out of communication devices. And all of the intelligence would go to the edge, so the core would stay dumb. And the people who made the internet won the award in 2004. It, it was Vinton Cerf and Robert E. Kahn. And they received the award for pioneering work on internet working, including the design and implementation of the internet's basic communication protocols, TCP IP, and for inspired leadership in networking. So the basic protocol of internet is TCP and IP. They are the people, these two are the people who first came up with the idea of TCP and IP and also built the systems. So TCP at low, TCP IP, you can use Ethernet or uh, wireless internet. You can also use the cellular network for internet. And all of that is based on the technologies of TCP and IP. So all of the web services, so this is a service, uh, a function that serves all the, TC, the many functions above it. So, so in the 60s, there was a lot of research on packet researching, but a lot of issues in packet, uh, packet switching came out as well. In the 1970s, there were so many there were so many implementations that were created based on the technologies of packet switching. And there were a competition between companies to make the best network. So how did Ethernet survive this competition? It doesn't have a token. So token networks can be very simple. 
and it's easy to make large networks. But the biggest issue with tokens is the moment the network, the token is gone, the network is also down. So token, basically, it means that only the people who have the token can use that network. So if you have the token, then you can send the packets. And then if you don't have to send packets, then you give the to token to someone else so that that person can use it. So this is one way to share resources. However, the problem is, let's say the computer that had the token died then you don't have the token anymore. And so you need to reset the token from the beginning. And this became very complicated when it came to trying to fix issues in communications. So although so packet tokening networks were taken over by uh, Ethernet. <clears throat> so going on to uh, Dr. Metcalf, let's Let's hear how difficult it was for him to get a PhD degree. He registered for the Harvard PhD program in 1969. But his actual research, so his professor advisor at Harvard seems to be not interested in what he was doing research. So his actual research took place at Project Mac at MIT. So he did things, a work connecting MIT mini computers to ARPANET. And ARPANET and that project was actually very successful. And later on, he didn't even have his PhD degree yet, but Xerox gave him his job offer because of his work. However, PhD uh, Harvard did not give him a pass for his PhD thesis. So McCalf said, I need to take a break. So he went to University of Hawaii. He went there to have fun or maybe research. It's not quite clear, but he went to University of Hawaii, and there was something called Alawanet at Hawaii. So Hawaii has five large islands, and there were there was a packet switching technology to connect the five islands. And University of Hawaii had created a wireless uh, packet networking system at Hawaii. And uh, Metcalf studied Aloha Head and realized, wow, this is such a great technology. So he did some research about how to fix the, some of the bugs that Aloha Net had. And he added that research to his uh, work, and he was able to receive his PhD. But Harvard University did not even uh, print his PhD report. If you look at the title, the title is Packet Communication. Nobody today would be able to write a paper like this with this title, Packet Communication, because it's so generic. But at this time, this was... This is was very new, and so after receiving his PhD degree, Metcalf <coughs> worked at Xerox. Uh, what Xerox did at the time was when they needed data, they would use Synchronet to get the data. Synchronet is like carrying around a disk in your pocket and then use it. So, for example, you you know, like US, it's like a USB. You take data, you put the data into the USB, and then you can move it somewhere else. So that's kind of what SneakerNet was. But Xerox said, "This is not what we want. We want to make a network." <coughs> So they wanted to create a network that can that could communicate that could connect thousands of devices like computers and printers. <coughs> and McAlf was able to do that. His first network implementation was 2.49 megabps. The reason for that is because the system clock of Alto Systems was 2.49 hertz. So he used Man the Manchester coding to create the first network implementation. So the 2.49 megabps is a very surprising speed. Do you remember the modems that we had uh, many years ago? I think it was about 100 kilobeats or uh, several dozen kilobeats. But at the time, in the 1970s, the researchers at Xerox were working with 2.49 megab Mbps. So the people who were with, working with them in Silicon Valley 
were so surprised that data was moving at 2.49 mega BPS. And then in 1973, the first Ethernet was operated. And even in, techno in textbooks, you can find this Ethernet sketch by Dr. McKelf. And so the yellow line is called the Ether. So sometimes if you, you know, sometimes some of the cable channels that you see on TV, these would come in through the either cable. So you can see the transceiver and the interface cable and the interface controller, which makes up the Ethernet sketch. And I believe that you will be able to see this in museums in the near future. Then he wrote a paper on Ethernet distributed packet switching for local computer networks. This came out in 1976 and was published in CSCM. So the authors was Robert Metcalf and David Boggs, and David Boggs played a large role in his work, but David Boggs uh, passed away very early, and, but he played an enormous role in the development of Ethernet. And they call it local area, local computer network. So even at this time, the term local area the network didn't exist. What did McKelf learn through his work at Alhuanet? Again, token rings, you need to have the token for it to run. For wireless, unlike wireless connections, for wired connections, once you send a signal, you don't know whether the other person is also talking. And so once you send the signal, and then if there isn't a response for a certain amount of time, then you would try sending another another signal again. But for wired connections, it is possible to hear who is sending signals. So Ethernet, so the uh, functions that were added to Ethernet was carrier sensing. And once you send all of your signals, and if you wait for the length of the Ethernet, then you would know that your packet was sent. But before you, your packet is sent, then if some kind of signal occurs, then you can know that there has been some kind of collision. So, Ethernet also started to have a collision detection function. And let's say you send a packet, but it keeps interfering with many other packets that other people sent. Then everyone who was doing wireless networks, what do they like? They like, the, they like to use the algorithms. And so if there were too many signals, then the transmissions would be suspended for a certain period of time. So I have a simple uh, image to explain to you what happened. So let's say there are several folks and they all collide. So all the packets, they are colliding. And so what can you do? Uh, you, but you can't know how many packets have collided and who the hosts are. And then what the hosts do is that if there's a collision, then they randomly back off. And the backing off is really random. And of course, even after the random back off, they could have another collision. So if that happens, then the uh, signals will back off again. And I believe that every uh, in computing, uh, back off is a very often used concept. So this concept of back off, backing off was implemented very efficiently into Ethernet technology. So the Ethernet technology became something that could be that was became very easy to use. So this technology is used not only for Ethernet but also for Wi-Fi as well. 
So for example, if you make a call and if the signal is too slow, then it would back off. So you can uh, type random back off on the internet. You can find many uh, relevant or irrelevant data on there. So in 1983, internet was standardized as IEEE. And in the beginning, it was only used in local area networks. But now it's also being used in metropolitan, metropolitan area networks and wide area networks. And now there are even different Ethernets for companies such as an Ethernet for Google and an Ethernet that uh, Microsoft uses. So what did Dr. McAuliffe do afterwards? He created a company called 3Com after leaving Xerox in 1979. Xero uh, 3Com went pu public in 1984. Its sales profits reached 5.7 billion USD in 1999, and then it was acquired by HP in 2010. He won the IEEE Medal of Honor in 1996 and won the Marconi Award in 2003. In 2007, he was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. From 2011, he served as a professor as at the University of Texas in Austin. Currently, he is a research professor at MIT, and he gave his Turing Award acceptance speech at the 2023 Web Conference. So if you want to watch his uh, acceptance speech, you can find it online. So, Professor Dr. McCaffe, so there's a National Inventors Hall of Fame, but there's also something called the Internet Fall of Fame. So, before that, I want to explain the enormous growth of the Internet. So based on the technologies, uh, so Ethernet won in the competition of all the technologies that were created in the 1970s. Uh, in the 1980s, France made something called Minitel and gave it out to all of its citizens. This is based on packet technology. And in the 90s, when I was doing my master's and PhDs, there were many different networks such as ISDN, BISDN, and ATM. So these were all competitors of Ethernet. Then in the 90s, NSFNet became private, and BitNet and CSNet all became integrated into one. So these were all working separately. But now those have those became inter networked. And country, and there were companies who would use their own networks in the world. So if you met people in the IBMs in the 90s, and they would use their own network to communicate. But all of those proprietary networks disappeared, and the web browser was created in the 1990s, and there was an enormous growth of internet since then. So after the privatization of NSFNet, people thought, how do we use this system? So uh, the web browser was created, and Dr. Tim Berners-Lee won the Turing Award for his work in developing the internet. So before we go, I want to share this. Uh, the, this is the Internet Hall of Fame for 2012. And so I wanted to point out some of the people. So you also find Al Gore, who was the vice president during the Clinton era. And there is also Tim Burring, who won the Turing Award. There are the people who made Linux here as well. And uh, Louis Posin, Leonard Kleinrock, and Paul Byrne are the people who created the idea of packet switching. And then we have Donald Davis from the United States, and people like Robert Kahn, Bint Cerf, who have won the Turing Awards for their work. And there is someone from KAIST in this Hall of Fame. Do you know who it is? It is Professor Jeon Gil-lam. And 
So, Vint Cerf and Robert Kahn, Tim Berners-Lee, these people already won the Turing Award. So, then who would be the next person to win the Turing Award? I think it will be Van Jacobson, because he is the one who made the communications for uh, the newest technology, so I believe he is a strong contender for the next Turing Award. And I would like to end my presentation here. Thank you. So the 2018 Turing Award laureates were Jeffrey E. Hinton, Jan Lekun, and Joshua Bengio. Just to sum up their um, achievement, and it would be Deep Neural Network, which is very uh, a critical component for um, deep learning of uh, components of computing. So I think that could be the um, essence of what I'm going to talk about today. So when we talk about AI, it is a uh, something that everyone's talking about, and it is very influential, and it's transforming our science field as well as our society when it comes to spe speech recognition, astronomy, and even into uh, our science, it is bringing a huge um, transformation. So the reason why the AI was able to be successful was that because of um, this technology called deep learning. Then what is deep learning? How can we define it? So I asked it to Google Bard. Uh, which is a uh, gener generative, like ChatGPT, sort of like a, a generative um, ChatGTP, and I asked it to uh, Google Bard, and it said that um, deep learning is a subset of machine learning that uses artificial uh, neural networks to learn from data. And I'm sure that many of you knew about this um, definition, and I thought it made sense. And those of you who used it may uh, fully understand what I'm talking about. And it's been uh, transforming a lot of uh, aspects in our society. And these three um, godfathers, like who have pioneered a deep learning domain, and they have worked uh, collectively together. They were like professors and the students. They have worked together for at least 30 years. And Professor Hinton has dedicated his 50 years of his life on deep learning. And they have also uh, established these conceptual foundations for deep networks and also identified a lot of interesting phenomena and also um, developed uh, engineering advances in practice. But uh, there's this one thing that I want to um, share with you. This deep learning, its development wasn't always easy, even from the beginning. So that is why I'm going to delve into the history of uh, deep learning. And if we go back to the 1950s, and the reason why I want us to go back to 1950s was because that uh, in 1950, Alan Turing asked a question about what is intelligence and can we, and how can we realize that our human intelligence on computer, and so. Uh, he made, came up with this concept that uh, if if these machines pass um, this uh, some kind of test, then 
then intelligence can't be realized in computers or on machines. So there were two paradigms since 1950s. First was uh, symbolic AI, and the other was the connectionist AI. So symbolic AI, simply put, is that so they utilize these symbols that humans can easily understand, and based on logics, they create this intelligence. So um, it can be um, understood as programming. So we create, uh, design, and we do the programming, and make uh, the orders, and that is also thought of as uh, the logic-based symbol. AI and connectionist AI, on the other hand, is that they are kind of arguing uh, against uh, symbolic AI, and they're saying that we you know we need some kind of like uh, make a connection that is uh, similar to um, some kind of like uh, you know like neural network of um, life beings. So, and they just need to learn the strength of um, these uh, neural networks. So this intelligence can be created through learning. So these were the group of people who said that intelligence can be learned uh, through um, uh, in adjusting the strength of these networks. But just to give you the answer of, of who's right, like whether the symbolic AI or the connectionist AI, is that if one picture is given, then symbolic AI can't solve it. And if we ask them uh, what's on in the picture and what's happening in the picture, then they can't explain it just by simply... And so for high definition, like Im images, like the pixels goes on the millionth, which is about uh, going beyond millionth. So it is very difficult to solve that. But in case of this connectionist AI, and as you can see in this picture, they just don't, um, they recognize beyond the objects and they also recognize the objects, the feelings, and they can capture uh, the, the moments, the distance Sub sub subtleties like moments. So in the beginning, um, this was the most important question, was that then how can they train themselves on these uh, connections of the networks? So that was sort of like a homework that uh, the scientists had to solve. So just like Turing, you know, they could have done a lot of like trial and errors and, you know, they ha could have, you know, kept some of the, you know, outcomes that was good and, you know, throw away, uh, get rid of the ideas or the things that did not turn out to be well. So the first thing that came out, uh, which was the initial model of neural network was perceptron. So if there's a lot of input signals, then those signals are being received and being associated and um, they could, uh, you know, uh, send it to the response units. And it was called uh, the using the activation function. And so through that, uh, and this guy named uh, Rosenblatt, he is the one who um, suggested su such idea. And so uh, these machines could learn, but those like features could not be learned by machines. And they could only learn the features that were given by the humans. And they could um, make outputs uh, based on those features given by humans. So in the year of 1969, Marvin Minska, Minsky, who was the founder of MIT AI Institute, and he uh, made uh, this um, paper on created a paper on uh, perceptron, and he criticized perceptron and said that, you know, I know that uh, this can, there are a lot of like strong limitations on perceptron because it becomes complex, then it cannot be able to solve those problems. And so that is why um, the first neural net winter has begun in the year of 1970s. So, 
So this neural net, uh, network kind of lost its traction after uh, Minsky's um, paper came out. And from the mid uh, 1970s, uh, like uh, you know, several people like suggested about this idea called back propagation, that was like in the 1980s. And so there was a huge question of like how can these machines learn when there are a lot of neurons? Because you know there were a lot of you know like methods such as uh, like mutation methods and reinforcement enforcement um, learning methods, but you know they could not um, you know train uh, these machines if there were a lot of like neurons. But when this uh, back propagation idea came out, uh, these connectionist AIs like uh, Hooray, and because you know it was able to bring up really good uh, performances because when it came out to some of the like uh, uh, recognition, image recognition um, things, uh, assignments, then they were able to perform well. So let me just give you a brief explanation about what neural network is. And uh, this is something uh, that was first um, proposed by McCulloch uh, Pitts neuron. So, so this is sort of like the signal uh, transmission system that can that is artificially like converted. So, so there's if there is soma body and inside the nucleus, it can be uh, you know send the sig signals. And in order to explain, uh, express that artificially, so then there's just the signal of X1, then based on how um, the strength of these signals, which is W, then it all are um, being associated to create an output. So in case of perceptron, they uh, add uh, activation function to it. But so but this was the initial um, model. But if there are so many of these different uh, neurons, then it could um, uh, be translated into an artificial neural network. Uh, so because you know humans also have so many different uh, neurons. So what uh, the connectionist AI did was that you know when these signals come in, then it moves on to other representations. Then how you are going to you know adjust those uh, strength was the key to solving this problem and we just needed to uh, you know adjust the weight and based on you know um, adjusting these weights then the these machines could learn the features so then how uh, can we uh, do that we know that this is a powerful network so our is when there are more neurons and when there are a lot of uh, a lot more inputs then they can bring out the better outcomes we know that this is a very powerful tool then how can these machines uh, you know learn good features and how can we train uh, these networks so through uh, supervised or unsupervised uh, trainings, so when there's an input, you need to keep on supervising to uh, until it draws an outcome that I wanted. So based on how you have um, supervised, then the outcome comes out differently. And there's this other uh, mutation method, which is sort of like the reinforcement learning. So you, based on the outcome that you see, and if you like it, and if you don't like it, then perhaps you can you know, change uh, the weights 
But you know, only by changing the weights, uh, it is very difficult to update so many different neurons. So that is why, uh, when uh, that uh, when the backpropagation algorithm was introduced, because you first need to do the forward forward um, propagation, and it brings out the uh, prediction for the outcome, and you just have to see like how that outcome, expected outcome, is close to my expected outcome or the wanted outcome. And you do um, the back press in order to get closer to the outcome that you want. But you know that outcome uh, can be drawn by uh, exactly accurately measuring by using uh, calculus because you know there are so many different neurons that they can have and for us to simultaneously uh, do the calculus of um, you know the c computation of this um, neurons then uh, you'll be able to uh, do the back propagation so when we did the back propagation algorithm and uh, when we were able to do that, uh, people started to be much more uh, interested in this neural network once again. Because, you know, this uh, model like started to work properly and well. Because when this neural work uh, network uh, was getting larger, uh, it was able to use well at scale through like optimization. But you know, even though it worked properly uh, and well, there was a huge um, disappointment again because you know there were uh, some other approaches like symbolic AI approach and other approaches as well they were much better like in the performance in terms of understanding um, that logic so when we wanted to um, make this neural network larger, we, uh, we could not uh, have these machines, you know, learn just by using uh, this back propagation. So that was a huge disappointment among the scientists. And uh, during that, uh, you know, the academia, amongst the people in the academia, so a series of like conferences and uh, top tier conferences, like uh, for like NIPS, when uh, uh, Professor Hinton submitted a paper, but his paper got rejected. And he asked the committee why his paper got rejected. And he got the answer saying that, and you know, there were two uh, uh, papers that were submitted for a neural network, but there were too many to, you know, accept um, those two papers. And ICML also rejected, saying that, you know, you're not supposed to submit a paper related to neural network. And this another professor sent, uh, sent, submitted a paper related to neural network to CVPR, related to a classification algorithm. And it was sort of like uh, doing really well technologically at the time, but it got rejected. And then the reviewer said that in your paper, you try to, uh, uh, you know, so at the, fr the frame of mind uh, in computer vision at the time, was that like if there's like an object, you know, then there should be rules for these, um, you know, machines to learn. Because we can't explain it. So they all got um, rejected. And so that is when uh, the second uh, winter for the neural network technology came. And after that, 
So the deep learning started to revolutionize. So if you look at the timeline, it's not accurate, but it was uh, roughly in the 2010s or 2009, and that is when this like revolutionary things happened for uh, deep learning. And Professor Hinton. Uh, said that the reason why we were able to have this boom again for this neural network was because, you know, we were able to have huge data, vast amount of data, and computation became much better because, you know, backpropagation algorithm was uh, existent even before this time. But when, uh, you know, they tried to, you know, uh, make the machines learn, uh, they weren't able to, you know, process it. And of course, there were a lot of like, you know, trials and errors and at the time as well. But when this came out to the world and the reason why it is uh, gaining a lot of um, high uh, Light was because of this vast amount of data and because of the advancement of the computing uh, systems as well. So when we're talking about like deep learning um, application, they talk about um, so this was the first uh, successful uh, task when it comes to the neural network and for the uh, AI connectionist because um, so, so this was to make the machine to recognize uh, the sound of the voice and Professor Hinton used um, used um, this uh, neural network and brought uh, a really good uh, performance compared to other technologies. And when that uh, research achievement came out, and then that's when people started to apply this neural network technology. And uh, for the object recognition, there is this thing called uh, ImageNet. There are a lot of uh, challengers at the time for the ImageNet. And they were the world uh, leading computer uh, division groups. And that is the time when I started to, you know, learn about um, deep learning. And that was a huge event when people started to get uh, gain a lot of interest on um, this deep learning. And uh, even after that, there were a lot of, um, you know, innovative um, experiments and tasks on deep learning. So there were uh, this, uh, like, sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, and we also uh, have this thing called a transformer. So, so it is translating from one language to the other, so that is why it is called uh, transformer, and including chat GPT, it has uh, dominated this language GPT. And uh, he said that, you know, this was the final nail in the coffin of symbolic AI. And that was because, you know, this uh, translation uh, technology is something that symbolic AI has to achieve. So it is an idea task. Because, you know, 
because of the symbols in and symbols out. But, you know, for the translations, uh, symbolic AIs can't uh, solve it, but it can be done through the neural network. So these type of advancements uh, are keep on coming out. And also for the vision, there's a lot of things that we still need to um, solve. So even if they put this noise, uh, you know, we can see that uh, it can be uh, recognized as panda, but, you know, neural network, it doesn't. Because, you know, like, if uh, he, like, turns a mixed turn around, then, like, people can recognize it, whereas uh, humans can recognize it, whereas the machines can recognize it that easily. And the other thing was that this is some so so this is something that I'm telling you is that that all came out from the Turing uh, lectures. So there's this another um, problem with neural network is that in the process of you know updating uh, this uh, weights through the back propagation is very artificial. So it is not the uh, same as how like humans do that because you know they themselves need to adjust uh, the speed of the changes to the weights. And made uh, this forward forward algorithm that came out uh, with so that can be, uh, you know, um, so he proposed this conceptual idea that can be learned without using this back propagation. So sum it up, like I, uh, you know, explained about uh, this neural network's development through, uh, you know, these historical events, and we are in this era of, like, 2020s. And so deep learning is rapidly, like, transforming science and society, and it has become a very, like, critical component to our daily lives. And, of course, I would like to give this uh, credit to um, Professor Hinton's lecture that was given through 2019 ACM, FCRC. And I would also like to thank all the participants who are uh, present here today. And also, this is my baby sitting on a baby chair. And I call, uh, I use this uh, hugging face API, and I have used that to, you know, put my baby's face in the picture. And even if we do that, there are still some errors, so there are still a long way to go for us. So thank you for listening. So we want to go over the history of cryptography. I think there are three major, major phases in terms of its history. So I divided it into classic, modern, and advanced cryptography. And we are currently in the era of advanced cryptography. The winners of the Turing Award for cryptography are those who created a new paradigm or have made great achievements in the area of cryptography technology. And those are have won the Turing Award. Hello, if you look at the definition of classical cryptography in the dictionary, they say it is the art of writing or solving code, codes. But I think this definition is outdated because, because uh, literally, the, it says an art and not a science. And I think that is because in the beginning, cryptography was ensured perfect communication between two parties sharing secret information. And the way that developed was seen as a kind of an art. And to meet the goals of private communication, many things such as codes were created. So today we call that private key encryption. So there are many codes or private key inscriptions uh, that were created over the years. In the past, there was very little theory behind decryption of codes. It was not systematic, or there were no logical uh, theoristy, uh, theory behind it. So cryptography was often seen as heuristic and an unprincipled design analysis. And because there was no theory behind it, the schemes would be proposed, broken, and then repeat. So the beginning of this classical cryptography goes uh, back to the BC era. So this is a very simple 
or type of cryptography. It is the Caesar cipher or a shifting cipher. So you're simply changing the order of the alphabet or the uh, number of the alphabet. And then in a more modern example of cryptography would be Enigma. Enigma was a machine developed by in Germany in the early 20th century and was used by Nazi Germany to encrypt military communications during World War II. So you can see in the photo what it looks like. So there are many pulleys, and every time you press a pulley, the machine would move and there would be a different printed text and the encrypted text. But of course, this was also broken by Turing, as you already know. Nowadays, uh, cryptography has developed even further. In the 70s, IBM developed the Data Encryption Standard, or DES. This was created with consultation with the NSA, and it was slightly modified for use, and was published as an official standard in 1977. And NSA, but then again, another standard was made in AES because there were concerns that the cryptography security level was too low. So these two would be some examples of classic cryptography. So up to here, you could say that cryptography stayed in the area of art. But from modern cryptography, you can see that art has is going more towards the era of the area of science. So, one of the uh, Rivest is one of also one of the people that I want to talk about today. He said that cryptography is a practice and study of technologies for secure communication in the presence of adversarial behavior. So, compared to the past, it covers a much broader scope. It's not just about private security, it's about data integrity and authentication, and also how to safely move the data into public key settings. Also, the tools used would be more rigorously analyzed. And the theory itself became much richer during this time. So these kinds of crypto mindset permitted not only cryptography, but other areas of computer security. So what the key questions are, so in the path that we had symmetric key decryption, which, there, which people would have share keys, and then they would decipher the message. But if you want to make the keys uh, possible, the, the people need to, to meet and share the keys beforehand. So you would know in the past you would see spies have these tiny code books and then they use passwords. I think you might ha have seen that kind of things in movies. But how can we have generate keys without them actually meeting and without a trusted third party? Also, how can we build secure communication without generating so many keys? Because if you want to have different terms of communication, then you had needed a new key every time, so that would be very inefficient. So how can we solve that issue? And the starting point of public key cryptography started in the 1970s. It started from Merkel in 1974. So looking at the winners of the Turing Awards in cryptography, so I just wanted to share some of the people who are relevant to cryptography. So Manuel Blom won in 1995, and Andrew Yao also won it in 2000. Their work was more on the theory of computational complexation. So today I want to talk more about the three uh, groups mentioned at the bottom. So if you look at the uh, actually, my presentation has is kind of not in this order of the winners. So I want to go first talk about talk first about first of all about Diffie and Hellman, who are the most recent winners, and then I will talk about RSA, and then I will talk about Mikali and Goldwasser. And Goldwasser and Mikali are uh, students of Manuel Bloom, who is the 1995 winner. 
So in 74, so Merkel, who has not, who unfortunately has not won a Turing Award, was an undergraduate student, and he took a computer security course at UC Berkeley and he submitted a seven-page proposal for as for homework. So he submitted it. At that time, his instructor, Professor Hoffman, reject that, rejected that paper. So Hoffman is only uh, known for this. So Merkel was very disappointed, and he dropped the course, and then he continued on with this uh, research. And then he submitted the paper to the communications of the ACM, in, but it was rejected in 1975. But after many resubmissions and discussions, it was eventually published in 1978. But at the time, there were also, again, many, so many uh, cryptography papers that, were that was published at that time. So it did not receive the credit that it should have received as the first paper for cryptography. So if you, he has a blog and if you go to the blog, he has he wrote a very long story and about his complaints about what happened during this time. So it seems he still heard about what happened back then. So his idea is to use puzzles. So puzzles are problems that can be solved. If you put in some effort, you can solve these problems. So, if you want to make it into a math, you just need a very short encryption key to solve it. So, the idea of the Merkle puzzle is that's. So I think, let's say I want to t ask one of these people, let's go somewhere nice for dinner, and but the where we go for dinner is secret. So I give you about 10 restaurants, and then I put it, the, the pair the number, a number to the restaurants, and I put it in the puzzle. And then the pe per person who receives the puzzle just needs to pick one of the puzzles and solve it. And then they could well know which puzzle the is number is it is being used and which key is being used. So then I just need to respond with the, you just need to respond with the key. So, but because I'm the one that made the puzzle, I would already know what the I already know how to solve the puzzle, so I would know what the answer is. And for other people, if you just look at the location and number and try to figure out the location, it will take some a lot of math work. So, what is the running complexity that I can have with the person I want to communicate with? And then, but there is a complexity gap between the person between me and the person receiving the puzzle. So, how can we receive achieve a better gap? So, for example, if I give them a hundred puzzles, then they need to solve all of the puzzles. So it's very complex. So. That kind of creates a complexity gap, and so I would like to create a better gap to make the puzzle better. So if you want to make, how can we make a bigger gap so that not other people cannot easily solve the puzzle? So, again, so Merkley was very disappointed, and then he went to uh, another university, and there he met uh, Diffie and Hellman. And I believe that he was very lucky to have met these two professors because they saw the value of Merkel's work. And then they use more formal language to write a better paper to share that knowledge. So they wrote the groundbreaking paper, New Directions in Cryptography, in 1976. And they published it as soon after they met Merkel. And this was the first time that the idea of asymmetric crypto systems were introduced. So some of the concepts that came out from this paper is the idea of a public key and a private key and that the two could be 
uh, divided. A public key would be something that is freely distributed and is used can be used for encryption. But the person receiving the key will have a private key that never need leave the receiving device, and it can it is used for this decryption. And things like digital signatures that we often use, for example, if you go to the ATT, if you type in H some of the websites, you can click there, have a lock on some of the websites, and if you click on the websites, you can see the digital signers. So you can be certified that these websites are not have not been contaminated and the data is authentic. So these kind of digital signatures could also be uh, a reverse process of the public key. So the Diffie and Hellman they s uh, created the concept of a public key and a private key, and they created something called the key exchange. This is an algorithm. So when two people want to share a secret, they don't have to meet in person. They can share the keys. And so uh, mathematically, it's called the discrete logarithm problem. So in the past, you can say that, co that cryptography was sometimes seen as something in the area of art and simple repetition. But from here on, cryptography started to take on a more scientific and mathematic method. So Diffie and Hillman uh, received the Turing Award a bit later than their actual work, but they received it in 2015 for their work. And but before the new directions in cryptography, they made a concrete algorithm for key exchange, and they made the concept of public key, but they did not exactly uh, provide a scheme for public cryptography. And the reason is because they needed to realize a one-way function, and they couldn't solve it. So the three people on the photo, Adi Shamir, Ron Rivest, and Leonard Adelman, very quickly found a way to solve the one-way function problem. So these three people, so it's called RSA from their last names. And the key they made is called the RSA trapdoor permutation. So they looked at the question of one-way functions, and they are the first people to actually create a public key. And when it comes to something the website security like SSL or TLS, uh, the RSA trapdoor is often used. And there are many digital signature schemes as well using RSA. So compared to the people, uh, to the other scientists before them, they, their work was recognized very early on, and they won the Turing Award in 2002. So I thought that I had to bring like something technical. So public key it has two picks up two uh, big primes. So it is a n equals p q, and then bring in some kind of like uh, integers, and then put it uh, at e for the encryption and d for uh, decryption, decryption, and for that to you know uh, uncipher like some of the encrypted. Um, message and if you do the uh, factorize the end then you can break the system and if you do that you need to have two big primes and it is very difficult to factorize those two primes so that is a basic belief and I used um, belief the word belief because like theoretically like to um, open uh, this brick RSA is not as difficult as factoring so doing the practical like a factoriza factorization it is the only way to break the codes for this RSA so uh, this factorization attack has uh, advanced as well so in the year of uh, 2005 I think there was this um, some research that has um, 830 uh, beats that has been like factorized uh, and so for the RSA they use like 4009 beats and things like that so with the current um, performance they can't break the code 
And uh, if the quantum computer comes out, then you know they can do the factorization. And then RSI will become useless. So that is sort of like um, some of like the rumors that's going around in the academia field. But it will take a lot of time being expected to develop this quantum computing. And if we do that, you know, they can also like, you know, use a bigger prime size to escape uh, such attacks. So like in the near future, uh, we can uh, still use like, you know, RSA um, until that uh, techni technological advancement occurs. So that was related to a public key crypto keys that was um, how uh, it uh, was um, born. And there was this uh, thing uh, called earliest publicly known. So this is something that was known in the uh, year of 1990s, but in the year of uh, 1960s, one researcher has talked about uh, RSI equivalent scheme for the public key, but he was part of, uh, you know, a British research government, and that was the time when a uh, computer was not developed, so that is why his research was kind of like uh, uncovered, was, wasn't uncovered. So that is why, like, uh, in the 1990s, it was kind of like known, but he wasn't able to receive the credit, the, the research in the 1960s, because that research was not uh, that well known at the time. And so there was this another um, research that um, was upgraded to another phase. So when this uh, public crypto key came out, um, uh, Goldweiser and uh, Mikali, they were the graduate students at UC Berkeley. And they were uh, the students of the uh, Professor Bloom, who won the Turing Prize in the year of 1995. And so they talked about how can you play poker game over the phone. So if you play this poker game, then there are a lot of aspects or the elements that you need to consider because you need to shuffle the cards and you need to draw the cards one by one and open it and you have to look at it and you have to do the bet it and you have to do the betting. And without uh, computers, Get, uh, help, can you simply play um, this game over the phone? So it's difficult, and yet you can still play over the phone. So in order to solve that, uh, they were able to, you know, draw really good outcomes uh, starting from that question. So um, they wrote uh, the papers in the era of like 1982, and that was uh, related to uh, probabilistic encryption. And the key question was that what is the secret? So in, when you make the crypto system, then what is the secret and what is the uh, target targeted goal that we need to reach? So those were the questions that first came out through these papers. So they have uh, established this formal definition of what secret is, and that is still uh, being very like, uh, that is the standard uh, definition in this uh, cryptography world. So they were the theoretic uh, foundations of uh, this secret. And when uh, they uh, received this uh, Turing Award, and there was this one article that um, talked about them, and they have formalized um, the security definitions. And they have also came up with, uh, created the mathematical structures to validate uh, that theory. And so this uh, they were the ones who brought this, um, you know, cryptography from art to into science. So that is something that godfathers uh, could do. So these two godfathers or godmother has, um, you know, conducted this research and was able to break through uh, a lot of things. And so that is why they have received uh, this Turing Award in the year of 2012. And the other contribution that they have made to uh, get a uh, Turing Award is something that I will explain later. So related to this first contribution, so they have uh, defined two uh, security definitions. First is the uh, security, semantic definition, security. So if there is an attacker, then and if there is a cipher text, they cannot gain any partial information 
about a secret. And so Cypress text indistinguishability is that if there are two um, messages and if there are cipher texts corresponding to each message, then which cipher text is responding to what message? Message. So that is kind of um, uh, that is the example of like ciphertext indistinguishability. So it is much more of like an abstract concept because you know you can't gain any information as a third party. So then how can that be like uh, formally you know expressed through um, theory? And what they did was that they um, you know proposed this simulation to define that. So simulation is something that if there's an attacker and if they're looking at some kind of like communication, then they can, you know, um, simulate that communication by themselves. And if they can't uh, gain an uh, information, then, you know, they can't gain that secret. So that is sort of like the new paradigm that came out and they were able to, uh, you know, um, prove that. And they also uh, showed that two definitions are equivalent, and so the cipher text indistinguishability has become a standard uh, definition of uh, modern cryptography. So uh, they uh, define that in terms of gain, so that is sort of like the trademark of the modern uh, cryptography. So if you look at this, uh, so this is sort of type of a game. And if you uh, look at this, watch this game, and if you give the message, and if you encrypt the first or the second uh, message, then you cannot distinguish either one, neither one. And so not only the secret uh, security definition, they also talked about how they can um, uh, achieve that is that you need to use this uh, probabilistic algorithm to do that and they were able to prove that so there are uh, papers titled uh, probabilistic encryption and that was the when it, that kind of concept did not um, was not apparent was not a, at the time so you need to have, have some kind of like randomness to this encryption um, process and then the probabilistic concept that needs to go in so that amongst the many ciphertexts there should be one uh, probabilistic algorithm that uh, corresponds to a lot of like ciphertexts so that is w the concept that they first um, proposed and they made the scheme out of it so they made the definition established the definition and they con constructed um, the definition as well so that is when how um, the modern crypto fee became from art into science. So this is the last chapter, which is about advanced uh, cryptography, because you know uh, now it has become into a it came into the science realm, and uh, we could have done like security proofs. So. And now the researchers, you know, like thought about what more they can do to cryptography and they wanted to like advance it. So um, it came into the another level. So they, they may be uh, a bit uh, less credited uh, compared to the Turing Award, but there's this uh, Gatto Prize, which gives to like outstanding uh, researchers as well. So Turing Award is not just for the, the theoretical novelty, but they also look at the practicality of how it is being well used in uh, reality as well. But, you know, the uh, Gatto Prize is much more uh, interested in the theories of the researchers that are very uh, interesting. So there was Goldwasser and Mikali when they received Turing Award. They had uh, two contributions. Uh, the second uh, contribution was the interactive proof system. And in Ghetto Prize, they have already like awarded them in the year of 1993. And then before uh, Turing uh, gave uh, award uh, gave them the prize and then after that you know it kind of like advanced into differential privacy learning with errors and things like that and 
And this is something that has been, uh, you know, like picked up by uh, ghetto prizes earlier, much ear earlier than Turing uh, prizes. So what is advanced cryptography? Just to give you a rough definition, so it goes beyond, uh, you know, encryption and signatures. So not just uh, data, they want to like protect uh, the computation as well. So that is what is called advanced cryptography. So these are some of the, um, you know, like representative like technologies or the key technologies of this advanced cryptography. So one is uh, zero knowledge proofs, secure multi-party computation, differential privacy, and fully homomorphic encryption. So the motivation behind uh, this advanced cryptography was that you know we talked about the you know advancement of like machine learning and then so there are a lot of you know data driven services that came out as well and so like these like IT companies that like started to like provide all these like personalized services such as like location services or like provide some kind of like financial services or where if we provide our um, you know like uh, purchase history then they gave us like tailored um, advertisements and things like that. But that was um, established. These services were have been established based on, you know, people, the users giving up their personal information. Because, you know, IT companies, they are providing us services, but at the same time, you know, they are collecting our personal information to create another uh, values. So, going beyond uh, you know providing services to us uh, these like personal information uh, is being are being um, abused so this uh, like uh, advanced crypto provides the ability to process data without ever seeing it so all like computations can be um, you know protected without any like trusted party so that is our belief so amongst the uh, Turing Award Prize winner there was this name um, Andrew Yao and in the year of 1982 he asked a question saying that let's say there are uh, two millionaires and if they want to know who's richer but, you know, they don't want to reveal their um, exact uh, asset, um, amount of the asset that they have, and yet you still know who's richer. And that is sort of like the Yao's uh, millionaire's problem. And it can be solved through advanced uh, cryptography technology. And this is something uh, goes beyond by safely transmitting and receiving, um, sending and receiving the message. And for, in order to solve that, this is something, uh, the technology that can be used, which is called uh, zero knowledge proofs. So they just need to validate uh, the statement that we want. But other than that, they don't provide any other information. So they called it zero knowledge proofs. And this technique is widely used in cryptocurrency because, you know, like in case of like, you know, the Bitcoin, the transaction history is being publicly, you know, disclosed. But in case of GKC, they use the cryptocurrency to do the transaction, but they don't like disclose um, the remaining, the balance that you have. The next thing is called MPC. Sorry, so going back to GKP, so they have uh, the, the second contribution is related to um, MPC. So there are uh, several parties and they want to do something, but, uh, you know, they want to share some information, but, but other information, they don't want to disclose it. So Yao has brought in this uh, Gabriel uh, circuit, and that was sort of like the side contribution while when he received the Turing Award, and Goldwasser and Mikali also, uh, you know, brought this GMW, the new protocol, and brought uh, made a lot of uh, you know good papers. 
And next one is differential privacy, which was um, invented in 2006. Let's say uh, if you have Google and if you want to know which emoticons are being used the most, and if you ask the uh, the uh, frequency uh, frequently used um, emoticons to the users, then you know there is this uh, you know it could be like uh, breaching the privacy of the users. And this uh, by using this uh, DP, you can uh, get the statistical like outcome that is quite accurate. And then the last one is called homomorphic encryption, and you can calculate uh, or comp do the computation uh, something that it has been encrypted. So you, if you have this encrypted personal information, and if you send it to the server, then they do the uh, encryption. And then uh, provide some uh, like such services that I have explained to you earlier. And it received the uh, Ghetto Prize last year. And I am also uh, have done some research in this area as well. So this is uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening.